Hello, highlighters. Erin King here. And I cannot tell you how beyond stoked I am to welcome today's guest. You guys put your hands together for the one, the only Jeffrey Shaw. Jeffrey, how are you? I'm great, Erin. I'm so thrilled to be here with you. Welcome to the show. We've been talking for the last 15 minutes and I have just been going on and on about your book. I, I bought the Kindle and it wasn't enough. I had to also order the paperback so I can bring it back with me to the beach this weekend on staycation and revisit it and highlight it and underline it. Jeffrey, this book is a game changer. <sighs> you're so sweet. Thank you. I mean, that's why we do this stuff, right? I mean, you know, it's like you're right. You put it out there in the world, but nothing, nothing compares to getting kind of that direct feedback for it. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. Uh, for sure. Well, the highlighters that are listening, a lot of them are like you and I. They are entrepreneurs. They are self-employed. And the opening line of your book will just make everyone feel attacked in the best possible way. And what you said was a lot of us go into this way of living because we want to control our own destiny. And then the question that you ask when people say that is, well, how's that working out? And what you're trying to call attention to and what you call attention to do so well is this myth, this lie, this perception of the freedom of self-employment when in many cases, pan rays right here, it can feel like running on a hamster wheel like a hot mess. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I've been asking people that question for years. Like, hey, why'd you become self-employed? Why'd you start your own thing? And everybody has the same answer. It's like, oh, I wanted to, some variation of it. Right? I want to control my destiny. I want to control my future. I want to control the hours I work. And I say, so how's that going for you? <laughs> right? And everybody laughs. It's like, uh, yeah, it didn't actually turn out that way. And so- with that question, you know, what do we do in the world? We look for what a problem is and then we, we try to solve it. So that got me years ago on this idea thinking about, well, how do we solve that problem? And I realized that I actually have been solving the, that problem in my own life. While I recognize the, the challenge of it, the problem of it, I've been solving it to the best, the best way that I knew of for years. And that is fundamentally, I believe that we can't control the circumstances of the world. We can't control economies. We, we can't even control a pandemic these days, right? We can't control the circumstances of the world, but here's what you can control. The only thing you can control is the, the environment you create for the results you want. Mm -hmm. As entrepreneurs, all we can do is put everything in the right place. Yeah. And you, you mentioned earlier when we were just chatting about, and it's such a hard thing to communicate, this balance between striving and letting go. Mm -hmm. And I think it's one of the biggest challenges for entrepreneurs is because we're so, we're striving, we're pushing, but there's also a letting go part. And I think that's where, I mean, so where you grind it out, where you work hard is in putting everything in the right place, creating the environment. But there's a certain amount of letting go and believing in yourself, believing that if you've put everything in the right place, believing that you probably have given yourself a 99% chance of success. Mm -hmm. And what doesn't succeed, you can't really fault yourself because you've done – where you can fault yourself is when you – and we always do. We look back and say, I should have done that differently. But if you get everything in the right place, in the right way, then you kind of have to let go and let it happen and let it work for you. I think you definitely have to learn – we all have to learn a little bit. It's, this has been the biggest lesson for me to let go a little bit and trust. Mm. And you have this phrase in your book and you say that getting clear – Getting you, you say you say we we don't let go of something until the benefits of what's ahead are greater than what we've been holding on to. Yeah, yeah, and that's so true. It's like we have to see that that what is ahead of us on our path, we have to see it with such clarity and be so excited about it. That's the only time that we yeah. have the audacity to let go of what's behind us and move forward. I just love that so much. And and you talk about this, this idea of the power of setting up the circumstances. And in your book, you tell this great story about going to the Westchester country club as a photographer. Yeah. Share yeah. that story with us, please, if you wouldn't mind. Oh, gosh. I'm so glad you liked that. Because actually, that was added in like after the fact, because I felt like we I needed a little bit more proof of concept. So I, I just kind of you know rolled right back through my life. And you, know, you remember these stories. So I was very early out in the world as a photographer. 
Um, and I was actually, so it's probably about three years in and, and the story of how I built my photography business is that I initially tried building my photography business in my hometown. Well, my hometown was this lower middle-class, tiny country town who would see had absolutely no interest in investing a fair amount of money in photographs. So I, I for three years, I, I was failing. So I was shifting to a higher end market. Now, mind you, as I told the story in my previous book, Lingo, I knew nothing about wealthy people. Like I didn't come from that. So I was doing all the work to figure it out. And one of, so I had this idea that, you know, affluent people belong to country clubs. So Westchester Country Club is one of the most prestigious, affluent country club, golf country clubs in the country. It's also a residential community. So it's, it's a gated community that people where residences live and the club is there. So I decided that they needed to know I existed, you know, they meaning the management of this club. I had no idea how this was going to happen, but I went, I went to the store, I bought a sport coat, left the tags on because I couldn't afford the sport coat and I was going to return it afterwards. Right. Mm -hmm. So the tags are like tucked in the back, you know, you know, I bet you know that trick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, somehow remarkably, and I don't, you know, you, at some point you just realize, man, some things are just meant to work out for you, but this guard gate let me in. And I, I think I was driving like a, a an Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme. I don't know what I was driving. It wasn't, it's not a sexy car. I think he probably thought I was a landscaper. So he let me through the gate because he didn't ask for ID and it's a gated community. So I get through this gate. So I go, I'm able to drive to the country club. So already I'm past gate number one. Shockingly, I go to the club, I big facade columns. I walk in the front door and there's a, a woman at the front desk and I asked to speak to the club manager. Now, again, I'm waiting to get rejected. And she said, sure. Okay. I'm like, why is this working for wow. me? So she gets up. She she rings the club manager. He walks out. And I think you can relate to this. He, he represents the most intimidating figure in the world to me, which is going to seem odd to people. But to me, even for who I am, the most intimidating figure in the world to me is a middle-aged white guy. Okay. I'll be honest. Like that, okay. I, I've always been so intimidated. And I was 23 years old. So he was just an intimidating fatherly figure to me, which already makes me really nervous. Yeah. And he walks out and there I am with photographs, some framed. I had some rolled up in a tube that were mounted on canvas. I introduced myself and I said, I, I don't, I'm not here with an ask. I simply want to show you my photographs and let you know that I exist. And so with certainly some trepidation, he was patient enough and I showed him a few photographs. When I was done, I said, look, I'm not asking anything of you. I just, let me give you my business card. And I said, if any of your members ask for a family photographer, would you keep me in mind? He said, well, I've been here for, I think he said 15 years. I've been here for 15 years. That's never happened, but thank you for coming. Kind of, you know, that kind mm -hmm. of smile. Two days later, I get a phone call from him. And he said, you're not going to believe this. He says, but like I said, I've been here for 15 years. No one has ever asked me for a family photographer. One of our members just walked out my office after they stopped in to ask if I knew a family photographer because they're having a family reunion at the club. Yes. And he goes, and of course I thought of you. And he said to me, this was the best part. He goes, young man, I don't know what you're up to, but keep doing it. I love it. Right? So and good. What, right. So that's why I told this story because what I was up to was what I fundamentally believe in is that you have to set up the circumstances to get the results you want. Mm. The fact of the matter is, Aaron, that guy has probably been asked many times over the years for a family photographer. Mm -hmm. He just wrote it off because there wasn't anybody that came to mind. In science, this is called brain priming, by the way. It, there's, a, there's a marketing strategy to this science called brain priming, which is people can only recognize what they know. It's why you may have never heard of a movie and then somebody tells you about it and you see it everywhere. Yes. Because it's yes. implanted. Yes. So a big marketing strategy is implant the idea. Let the world know you exist. I let this world, this guy know I existed. And two days later, I went on to, by the way, to photograph not only that family multiple times, I became a really well-known photographer in that exclusive club and did tons of photography for the residents of the Westchester Country Club. Like it's tons. such a great story. And what a fantastic start. I love that the universe was working for you. Yeah. You put out your intention, you had a strategy, and then all these coincidences, big air quote, happened yeah. to line you up for that, that successful yeah. beginning. And I think all of us have that sort of magical 
many of us had that magical start story. We all look back and say, we can't believe we pulled that off. Yeah. We can't believe yeah. they let us do it. But then once we get started, we're like, oh my gosh, this is it. It's going to be happy days and just raining sunshine and rainbows and glitter and money from now on. And yet we know that just getting started is just getting started. Right. And so I love when in your book, you then sort of move into identifying if we as entrepreneurs and solopreneurs, after we have our magical, our magical launch, if we are in what you call an unhealthy ecosystem mm -hmm. and you lay out all these different symptoms. And I think we all know that when we are feeling overworked, that the results are not what we want them to be, that we are feeling like we're doing all the things, but we don't see the results in our P&L at the end of the year. There's nothing worse than feeling like you just crushed it for months and months. And then look at your margins and you look at your numbers and you're like, this is impossible. Mm -hmm. How can this not be five times greater considering the amount of gray hair and sleepless nights and blood, sweat, and tears? And Gray hair. Yeah, same, same. <laughs> I just color mine, yeah. And and then you talk about that 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 – Existing as an entrepreneur in this unhealthy ecosystem does not have to be our reality. Mm -hmm. And you offer this formula for success that has three pillars to it. You talk about yeah. personal development, business strategies, and daily habits. And I love how you break down these three different components. And so, and so let's can we unpack some of those a little yeah. bit? Like let's talk at first about personal development. And I thought it was interesting that you led with that before business strategy. Tell me about that. I want to hear about that uh, choice. Let's hear yeah. it. So, oh my gosh, so much of what you've just offered. Uh, you know, for one, yes, it, it, every, until it's fixed, almost everyone, almost every entrepreneur is walking around with a broken ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And it's not your fault, mm -hmm. right? Because no one has taught you otherwise. Mm -hmm. Okay, so first of all, as soon as I mention the ecosystem, it already starts shifting people's mindset because our experience as small business owners is very siloed, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and the world wants us to be like the rest of the world can say, oh, don't take it personal. It's business. You know, it's like, yeah, but when you're self employed, it's all personal. 100%. Right? So that, that whole modality doesn't work for us when it might, might work for other people. Um, so, and in order for us to manage all the parts, nothing in our life is centralized. We don't have a marketing department and a cleaning department. We're all that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we don't have the, the benefits centralized. We also have literally had to run around to so many different sources to get what we need because nothing about self-employment is centralized. We have to go to conferences. We hire gurus and we hire coaches and we buy online programs. So we're running all over the place to get what we need because nothing's been centralized for us. There isn't a... Well, I should say there isn't. There is now because I'm just launching the Self-Employed Business Institute to solve this problem. Love but it. prior to this, I mean, that's why I'm launching it because there's no educational format that actually is realistic as a self-employed business owner that brings it all together. So it's not your fault because literally the world has not been structured, set up for you to have everything you need in one place. You're running yeah. all over the place. Even us with this podcast. I had the wrong time scheduled and then I couldn't do the other time. And you were yeah. probably like, this girl's a hot mess. And no, it was just this no. high class problem of I had all these gigs and I just, I don't have my systems where they need to be. I'll admit yeah. that straight up. And so I can't wait to hear more. So yeah. I'm sorry. So then, so I started to think again, <laughs> fundamentally, I've always been striving to solve the problem of not being able to control our destiny and realize it's, a, it's an ecosystem. And when we begin to look at an ecosystem, these are the three sections that if they're all firing at a healthy level, not equal. Okay. Mm -hmm. You're not going to spend the same amount of time in your business, personal development as you will in your business strategies. No, it takes more business strategy. But the problem is, is that most people are putting all their effort towards the action steps, the business strategy at the, at the sacrifice of, of personal development and the daily habits. So let's break it down. As you said, the personal yep. development, the reason I start with that is that there is no other choice. And that is fundamentally one of the problems. It is pointless to keep adding more to-dos, adding more action steps until you have done the personal development work to increase the capacity for the more action to work. And the capacity is the key word here. What I'm striving to help people to do is to increase not just the capacity of what their business can handle, but their inner capacity. Mm -hmm. You can't have more success in your life until you truly believe you deserve more success, mm. right? It's one of the biggest hangups. Like you have to, you have to first increase the capacity of what you feel you deserve 
before you put more action into it to try to get that, that you're actually, because then you're pushing it away. It's like trying to overstuff a sack. Mm -hmm. So we start with personal development so that everything opens up. What opens up is what you think you're capable of, what you now know you're capable of, what you believe in yourself, what you think you deserve. So you have literally created space around your being. So now when you get to work and take those action steps, bring it on. You, mm. I deserve more. I'm more. It's way beyond abundant mindset. It's, it's again, creating the circumstances for the more to fit in. Aaron, I cannot tell you for years how often clients reach out to me for coaching. They're paying me money to increase their business. And then they come to every coaching call telling me how overwhelmed they are. Mm. And I'm like, do you see the irony here? Like you're asking me to fit more into what you already can't handle. Mm -hmm. So before we get into the more, we need to fix the overwhelm. We need to fix the attitude of not being able to handle it. Can I just tag on for a second? I love yeah. everything about this. I literally have chills. I'm this, I need, you're speaking to me selfishly. If no one else is picking up what he's putting down, <laughs> I am getting so much out of this. So thank you so much. I just came from Virtuoso Travel Week mm -hmm. and I was speaking with Ron Tite and Mike and Nino and Neen the best James of the best. and yep. Jill Shepard and the whole crew. And we were all asked individually on this live interview, all the speakers, what is the one most important business piece of business advice that you would give for the second half of 2021? And none of us could hear what the other one was saying. We only found out later that we all had the exact same answer. Awesome. And it's what you are saying. It's not about the more. It's not about all the things, anxiety. It is about having the, the discipline and the focus to find the one and to go deep and narrow because we just don't have, to use your word, the capacity right. to keep adding on, particularly in these nut, crazy nutso times at the time of recording, which is mid-August, we're not sure what by the time this thing drops in next month, who this knows? Delta thing, who knows? Yeah. And so just to yeah. just retweet the heck out of what you are saying. So yeah. I agree. No, it's, you know, one of, uh, there's a quote that I recite by Jim Rohn in the book constantly to the point where my editor made to say, I'm going to say it again. Like, cause I say it so many times. The quote is that your level of success rarely exceeds your level of personal development. Mm. All right. I mean, wow. that's, so anytime I've ever wanted to grow my business, I grew myself first. And that is the secret to success. It doesn't begin with just working harder. It works with growing yourself first and increase the capacity so that the work you do is efficient and effective. Mm. So that's why I start with personal development. And then, yeah, there's a lot of, you know, by personal development, I mean, it's, it's, we're always working on ourselves and yeah. there's, you know, but then the business strategy, yeah, that's well, the meatiest part. Go ahead. Well, before we talk, cause, because I think for a lot of us listening, you know, entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, when we think of personal development, maybe this is how I was raised, but it feels almost like a luxury. It feels mm -hmm. almost like a when you have time, like a nice to have versus a need to have. And that's not true because, because to use everything you just said, I mean, we cannot show up as the fullest expression of what people need from us unless we put this first. It's kind of like when you think you don't have time to work out, yeah. but in reality, if you don't have your health, you can't do anything else. Everything else is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so I just want to give everyone just pause to really, can you authorize yourself to prioritize that self-development that you've been kicking down the road? You're going to go to that conference, finish that book, listen to that podcast, get more clear on that strategy. It always seems to be after all these small everyday mm -hmm. tactical items. But, but if we could all just even take – a, a day, an hour, a minute to ask ourselves, have we taken time for personal development in a small bite-sized chunk today and see what the impact is over time? I just, I just, I agree with it so much. And yet it tends to be the last thing yeah. for me anyway, that I tackle. Yeah. So I love that is why, yeah. And that, that is yeah. why I put it first, because again, it solves a problem. People yeah. get into action before they've expanded the capacity. And to me yeah. personal, and I was so careful with the choice of words. First of all, I don't use the word self-help because I don't see people as broken. So I don't want mm -hmm. them to feel like they need help. Uh, it's not really self-care, although self-care is tucked in. Uh, and that's why I chose, and I, did, I also battled between personal growth and personal development. And I chose specifically personal development because I felt like that's, it was a creation aspect to the word development. Yeah. yeah I love um, it. But that's how I look at it. Personal development is all of that. It's the self-care you need 
to give yourself the time and, and care for oneself to develop yourself and increase your capacity. Yeah. It's yeah. so good. And then you move from there to business strategies. And there's so much you packed into that section. I mean, you're talking yeah. about what you call the business model of multiples. Mm -hmm. And and you talk a lot about systems. And one of the best things that you said, which I loved, was you said, we should strive to be bored. Yeah. Strive to be bored when it comes to our systems of success. Yeah. The day that I am bored with one of my success systems, like talk dirty. How do we do that? <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing, it's, it's, a, it's an idea to strive to be bored so that you've created space for the more that you want. Yeah. Okay. So you're not going to stay bored uh, perhaps, but in order to move our businesses forward, we have to create the space, right? We have to, whether that space is created by delegation by getting rid of busy work. You know, my previous book, Lingo, was entirely about how to, it's a branding brand message strategy to attract your ideal customers. Because I have fundamentally always believed, I, I, I dispute the Pareto principle, right? I get it mathematically works for a lot of people, but the old adage that, you know, 80% of your income comes from 20% of the customers. Great, in theory, might work mathematically. The problem is what that really means is you're wasting your time out of eight, on eight out of 10 customers. Mm -hmm. Like who has time for that? Mm -hmm. So that's why my philosophy in business has always been, no, no, only work with your ideal customers. It will pay you exponentially to start your business that way right away or change your business. So you only work with your ideal customers because they are the most profitable. They're the most fun to work with. They are also the ones that they, they've already value what you do and they fly through everything quicker and create higher value. Like it's so easy. And that leaves you space for more ideal customers. The problem mm -hmm. is bad customers, they're the ones we jump over, jump, we bend over backwards or jump through hoops for the least profitable. They're taking totally. up space. Get rid of them. Totally. And that's how you started your whole career. You were you said, who do I want to work with? I want to work with these interesting, affluent personalities, yep. these characters in this mythical gated community. I mean, you I, you identified the customer first and everything yep. else exploded from there. It's so Correct. genius. Correct. So it's, you know, the idea of striving to be bored is really, it's like I said, it's about making space. It's about looking at where bad customers are taking space, your production, your system. What can you automate? What can you delegate? Uh, so if you're always striving to be bored, what we know happens is something else will come along and with your success, you have a stronger filter of discernment to decide what is the right thing to take, right? Mm -hmm. So then you're just, you're constantly creating space, filling it back up, but you're filling it back up with the best opportunities, the most ideal clients. You know, when I look back at my photography career and I say, you know, a hundred percent of my income came from a hundred percent of my ideal clients. There weren't any clunkers. It's so true. I mean, even running my agency for 10 years, it was always the clients that drove us insane, that nickel and dimed you, that had the smallest contract. And then the, the, the clients that you had a great laugh during the strategy session, they spent no problem, paid on time. I mean, it really is true. And, yeah. and there's just such a, for a lot of us, we're so afraid to say no yeah. to clients that aren't in alignment with who we are. We're just so afraid of, of releasing them. And, and it's crazy because I'll never forget when I fired my first big client and I talk about it in my book. Um, you know, you probably have one of their credit cards in your wallet right now. And it was like, you can't fire so-and-so. And it's like, Yes, we can because everyone's miserable. It's yeah. not that much money. We, we already have the, you know, the the vanity metric of having worked with them or whatever their value was going to be. And it was so crazy because once we freed up the space to use your term, mm -hmm. well, sure enough, five more clients that were smaller but more fun and brought yeah. us more joy came in right away. But we didn't have space for them before because this yeah. big, giant, annoying whale that wasn't even our people was taking up that room. So I love that you say about find the client, create the space, and then just watch the magic unfold, yeah. right? I, I tell you, my number one criteria for who my ideal client is, it's selfish. Who enables me to do my best job? I love it. I mean, that is the number, that's my number one criteria. I will not take on a client. In fact, I actually have a name for them. I call them wantrepreneurs. I mean, it sounds really negative, <laughs> but I've just, there are a lot of wantrepreneurs out there. There are a lot of, and they will throw money at you. They're the ones that they will throw money at you, but I just, I can feel it that they're not going to do anything with the help that I give them, yeah. which means they can't end up being like in my portfolio of successful clients. Yeah. So I don't and, take them. Yeah. And well, I love that. I love it. And it sounds so easy and glamorous, but it really is hard. But the good news is once you snip one, once you, once you do it the first time, it's like a gateway firing. And then all of a sudden you're like, huh, 
that felt pretty good. I can, yeah. And you have the regret. You have you have what I had, like the firer's remorse, where like the next day I'm like, what did I just do? Am I an idiot? But then once you do it the one time, you kind of it gets easier, right? And you start to see the success happen. So and the universe is nasty, Aaron. And you know this is yeah. a speaker. You know that when you take that free speaking gig, or maybe you used to, yeah, you know that a great paying gig is gonna come along at the same time. So Every the universe time. is nasty. Murphy's law. Murphy's law. <laughs> it's going to exactly. pay you, it's gonna teach you that lesson. It's so true. So uh, Jeffrey, one of the things I also love. I love so much about your book. Oh my gosh. But I love how you describe the emotional journey of our customers. And you have this beautiful uh, model that you create, this beautiful visual model. And you lay out all these different things, you know, the look and feel of your brand when they first meet you, how you create the connection, the problems you can help them solve. And you go through all these different, this sort of customer journey. And, mm -hmm. and you have it shaped um, sort of like the food pyramid. But obviously, we know it depends. Sometimes it's a little bit of more like a tangled shoelace. Sometimes it's not so linear, but, but the steps you have, each one was so important. What I found to be really interesting was the very last step of the customer journey was what you said, um, your authority. Mm -hmm. So who, why you're the expert. And I found that so interesting because typically what you see, whether it's in how we market ourselves, present ourselves with our business development, it's usually an inversion of that where we lead with our authority, but you, you put that last intentionally. Yeah. So with all due respect, I love Simon Sinek. I'm so glad he started the world thinking about why, particularly the business world, and has been saying start with why since what, 2012 when he did his TEDx talk? The problem is what that became is everybody talking about themselves mm. and being in business is not about your, about you. It's about who you serve. Mm -hmm. So my philosophy is end with why. And that's why I call it the authority section. And it is from a marketing perspective, so much more compelling because in the emotional journey of your business, uh, and in the book, I use the example of a homepage and a website because it's a good visual for people to grasp. Okay. So it's all about the person landing on that website. It's when that opens, they need to feel like they're in the right place, right? Mm -hmm. There needs to be a standout statement that speaks to them. It then needs to, the very next uh, step on the process, it needs to, they need to feel like you are in their head. To me, the most, our goal that we're striving for in marketing is for people to say, wow, it's like you're in my head. That's my entire goal. It's not a compliment. It's not, what I'm trying to get people to do for myself and for the clients that I coach is I want their customers to say to them, wow, it's like you're in my head. So right after they know they're in the right place, you then want to really tap into their emotions and you're able to do that. And this is how I coach because we want to understand what are those emotions? What are the emotional triggers of the people you're going to serve? What are the intimate things you can say that they're like, how do you even know this? One of my, I'll give you a quick story. One of my favorite clients. Uh, it's a company called Agalala Comfort. Agalala Comfort makes really high-end comforters and pillows, and they're made out of milkweed instead of down. It's okay. fascinating. And there's a whole bunch of reasons. Why. One of the reasons why milkweed is such an amazing substance for a comforter is breathable. It's much more breathable than any other bedding material. So on their website, the compelling statement, it says, imagine comforters so breathable, you don't have to stick your foot out. <laughs> right they have gotten so much response because you know what if you ask people most people sleep with one foot outside the comforter why because your nerves on the bottom of your feet control your body temperature it was such a weird thing to say on a website that people i mean people were responding to it Brilliant. it's like it's almost like you're in our bedroom like how do you know that like right. how do you know i sleep Are you watching like, us sleep <laughs> right it's, it's a little weird but it creates an intimacy yeah so the reason i so you're going through this process of it's all about them. It's all about them. It's all about them. And then when you get to the end, which is why I say end with why, you share why you do what you do. You share mm. what gives you the right to do this. And what happens is to the visitor or the person experiencing this journey with you, they feel like, and this is uh, in lingo. Lingo is all about imagining what you want people to say. I want people to say in their head at that point, oh my gosh, it's no wonder this is what you do. Yeah. It's after you've sold them, if you will, you seal the deal by them feeling like it's no wonder this is what you do. I can't choose anybody else. Done. Yeah. It, what I love, you're basically saying show them what an authority you are throughout the process without even having to tell them. Show really. them that you get them. Yeah. That's really what it comes down to. Like show them you get them. Yeah. And it's then so tell good. them who you are and why you do what you do and you've sealed the deal.
It's so, it's so strong and it really, it goes hand in hand, I guess, pun intended with what you call hug marketing, which is this honest, transparent, authentic human approach to, to how we present ourselves online, offline, you know, all the time. Um, so how do we know if the way that we're positioning ourselves is in line with what you call hug marketing and what is hug marketing? Yeah, to, so to I love, down? this is my favorite thing in the book, honestly, because I, you know, most marketing words are horrible. I hate the fact that we refer to people as a target audience or target market. I, you know, I, 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 all the words in marketing are, are such a bad energy. And again, I am so, I'm such a believer of the energy of words. That's why I wrote a book called The Lingo to teach people how to use the right energy of words. But we also have to, I'm such a believer in taking responsibility for the, what you say and the impact it has on other people. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, one of those marketing words that I just have always hated is a marketing funnel. Mm -hmm. Because first of all, it's visual. When I think of a marketing funnel, it looks like you're open-minded and open-hearted and wide open at the top, but it's got this conniving energy to it that I'm going to take people through a process and squeeze them through a small hole at the bottom. Like there's a there's a conniving to a marketing funnel. There's this, it's almost too strategic minded. Like I get it. I'm a businessman, you know, I get it. But it's a little conniving to me. So I was, I've was i always been looking for something else. And I came up with this idea. Actually, it started from, as many things do, from the inside out. What I, what I feel the ultimate goal should be as business owners that we want customers that are so loyal, that come back to us over and over again, that tell other people that you can't imagine seeing them in person and not giving them a hug. Mm. And I realized as a photographer one of the, whether it's a physical hug or not, one of the gestures I picked up on many years ago in my photography career, when I knew that I had achieved that level of relationship was when the children, the kids would come running out of the house. When I pulled in the driveway to photograph the family, the kids are running out of the house saying, Jeffrey Shaw's here, Jeffrey Shaw's here. Because all kids say my name, one word, Jeffrey Shaw, it's one word. <laughs> Every child, like, Jeffrey Shaw's I call here, you Jeffrey, Jeffrey Shaw. Shaw. <laughs> so, most people do. I don't know why. It's one word, Jeffrey Shaw. <laughs> That I realized whether they actually physically, and they usually did physically hug, you know, they wrapped their hands around my waist. And I realized that's a whole other level. That's beyond getting a customer, right? Yeah. So the hug marketing concept is a series of concentric circles that starts from the outside in. The outermost ring are what I call lurkers. You have, Aaron, you have millions of lurkers, millions. Like lurkers are the people that are watching you from afar. And you don't even know they're there and you don't know them by name. But they're really important. They're the people that are watching all the amazing things you do on social media. You're, I don't know, what, gazillion Instagram followers? Hardly, <laughs> but you're sweet. <laughs> I've lost track. Like, <laughs> we, we all aspire. Um, but those are your lurkers. The, the strategy, though, is to understand how are you taking responsibility as a business owner to make to bring them from lurkers to the next circle in, which is curious. What are you going to do to make them curious? And once they become curious, what are you going to do to get them to become engaged? Like, how do you, which you, again, you do so well, how do you get people then actively engage in what you're doing mm -hmm. with the hope that you're then going to get them to connect with you? That's when they likely opt into your email list. That's when they have surrendered that it's now a two-way street. Because up to then, they've been watching you from the outside and they're in control. When they connect with you and surrender their email address, they're welcoming a two-way conversation, which mm -hmm. needs to be respected. Mm -hmm. Okay. But then it's from there that you're hoping to make them a client mm -hmm. or a customer, but we don't want to stop there. The next goal is how do you turn that customer into the hug customer? Mm -hmm. So hug marketing is for me largely visual because I, I just couldn't energetically look at people from open hearted to squeezing them through a hole. I wanted to look at them. How do I bring them from the outside circles inward? And I also look at it just, you know, central, like how do you bring them to your heart? How do you get them centered to this, you know, to you? when you would see them, you give them a hug. So it mm -hmm. has completely over the years of doing it this way has inverted how I think about marketing to the point that we actually internally, we don't have a marketing plan. We call it an enrolling plan because I want to take responsibility for what I need to do to enroll people to get to them to walk towards me. It's not mm -hmm. up to them to walk towards me. It's up to me to be interesting enough to get people to walk towards me. Jeffrey, I love it so much. And I love that you are so true to your own personal brand because every single thing you're talking about, you weave in this refreshing positivity. 
You have such positivity. I don't want to have a funnel because it's squeezing people. I don't want it to be a target because you're shooting people. I don't want it to be like you're very intentional about your your positivity and not in a toxic positivity, annoying rah-rah way, just in a genuinely good human way. And I think it's a great segue into the third aspect of your framework, which are your daily habits. Yeah. And one of the daily habits that I am obsessed with is what you call your, again, with the positivity, your what's going right journal. Yeah. Tell us about the what's going right journal. I love this. This changed my life. And I, I developed the idea of this at a very low point, broken relation. I just moved mm -hmm. to Miami. It was a broken relationship. It was a really rough breakup. A lot was going wrong. And I had to turn it around. I now I had made a decision to stay in a city where I didn't know anybody because I moved here in a relationship. It broke up shortly after. So I needed to turn that ship around. It was not going in a good direction. And what I love, Aaron, and I hopefully this is evident, is I love... I, I can be as spiritual and woo-woo as anybody, but I really like tangible results. Like I will only... Maybe I'm shallow. I will only put effort into the woo-woo unless it's going to pay off, right? Fair enough. Because I'm just not kumbaya. Like I don't do, you know, things just to, for this. I like results and I also like efficiency. And that's one of the key components of being self-employed. It's like, man, we have to do things that are really highly efficient level because we don't have time. So I was looking for what could work. And I, I tried a gratitude journal. Like I totally respect gratitude. I love the concept of gratitude, but I'm pretty grateful if I'm waking up and I'm breathing and the sun is shining and my dog is next to me. Like I just, I'm not seeing anything positive coming from this. So I had this idea, just again, working with the science of the brain, because as humans, we are still, maybe always will be wired towards survival. We're mm -hmm. wired to, towards our threats. We're wired to negativity. You can hear, you know, as a speaker, right? Don't you focus on the one negative review of your talk? Always. Like not the 500 that were positive. Mm -hmm. We're wired that way because we're always looking for the threats. What's a threat? Nowadays, the threats are not lions and tigers and bears. The threats are our sense of value, our sense of self-worth, our sense of ego. Those are serious threats to our well-being. And so when there's a threat to that, we that's all we can focus on. The what's going right journal reverses that, scientifically reverses it. So what it is, is the practice of, it was a bit of a struggle for me in the beginning, especially because I was starting it at a, a downtime. It is sitting down and journaling what's going right. I start every sentence. What's going right is, right? what's going right is I'm meeting some really awesome people who might lead to deeper relationships. What's going right is uh, I got a new client. What's going right is, you know, my relationship's going. What's going right is it's, it's forcing the brain to see what's going right. And I think we all most everyone can agree because this has been said enough times that what you focus on, you get more of. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what, if you focus on what's going right, it starts feeding on itself. Next thing you know, you've journaled for five minutes in the morning, but throughout the day you're like, okay, that went good. That went right. Mm -hmm. Right. You start seeing more of what's going right. And it just tips a scale so that you almost, you brush off what's not going right much quicker or what's, you know, what's going wrong and you focus because you're focusing on what's going right. It has been the simplest practice with real tangible results that if for some, if I'm off habit, I can feel it. Like yeah. I can feel the res I feel like I'm not noticing what's going right. And we're talking and this, I said this early on, like these three parts of the ecosystem, personal development, business strategies, daily habits, they're not in equal amount. We will always put more effort into business strategy. Mm -hmm. What I teach are daily habits that take maybe 15 minutes a day, right? 10 minutes of meditation, five to seven minutes journaling, affirmations that I'm a big believer in, but I do affirmations while I'm walking my dog, right? I'm mm -hmm. running this through my mind. So you can multitask in that sense. But incredibly efficient meditation to kind of clear the mind, open it up, and then I journal the what's going right journal, the common edition of those two things has always for years now has set my mind in the right place. And I have, I I've lost, I have countless clients that have adopted this practice of the what's going right journal. And I think it's a game changer. It really is. And I loved in your podcast when you opened up by saying, what's going right for you right now? Yeah. And it's just a, it's a rewiring. It's an intentional shift in focus from threat to celebratory yep. and it's a choice. And yeah. I just, I think it's fabulous. So before we wrap up, I want to talk a little bit about 
where you sort of take the book, where you talk about how important it is. There's actually two things I want, I want to tackle. One is, which way do I want to go? Let's go, let's do one thing. Okay, back it up. By the way, editor, let's edit that part because I just lost my mind. Okay. Um, so you talk in the book about how getting clear about what you want to get away from is as important as knowing what we're running towards. So we've kind of tackled positivity. We've tackled the what's going right journal. But in the book, you do talk about identifying things that are not for you, not going right, yeah. not your jam, and how that's sort of the first step that we have to tackle before we even know the direction we should run towards. So how do we get clear yeah. oh my about gosh. what we should get away from? Yeah, I and it is, it is, and it can, can seem contradictory because actually what it is, you need to, it is, you're tapping into something negative. And, and, but here's where it comes from. It's a combination of things. For one, it was observation of, coaching clients that weren't actually making the changes that they needed to make, particularly coaching clients that where it seemed most more evident were coaching clients that were struggling financially. And I kind of, I finally came to the conclusion, as I boldly said to one client, I said, you know what? The problem is you don't hate being broke enough. Like, <laughs> and I just, and it was, it was actually a profound, it just like came wow. out of my mouth and I'm realizing that is fundamentally the problem. Broke. You don't hate being broke enough. So that's why you keep circling back into it. Right. It's like an addiction, <laughs> right? I mean, you just keep, she keeps moving forward. She was moving forward. Going back. And I said, you just don't hate being broke enough. And until you hate absolutely being broke, you're tired of, you're tired of the embarrassment. You're tired of how it's hurting your self-esteem until you're sick and tired of being broke. You're not actually going to fix it. And she still, for a long time, still wasn't willing to do it. And I eventually just couldn't help her anymore. We had yeah. to end their coaching relationship. Um, and that is was the beginning of my of looking at this observation, why people don't actually change their life is because they don't actually hate what they say they want to change. Yeah. That combined with the fact that I'm an avid kayaker. And I started looking at the power of motivation and what I refer to as push and pull, right? So- because that's always been intriguing for the motivation. Like in the, one of the scenarios I give in the book is that what really motivates a child to eat their vegetables? Is it the threat of no dessert? If you don't eat your dessert, you're not going to have your vegetables. Because, you know, I had raised three kids. It didn't really work. What worked were airplane noises. Mm. <laughs> right? Right? There was something positive about the airplane noise that they would swallow the broccoli. The threat mm. of dessert didn't do it. The threat of no dessert didn't do it. And I started all these things. And then in kayaking, I'm the front guy in the kayak. Rob is behind me. And the only reason I'm up front is because I can cross my legs from years of yoga and he can't. So there I take go. the front seat. Right? I love it. <laughs> That's the only reason. <laughs> um, but what I realized is that we're paddling in a two-person ki uh, kayak. When he stops paddling, we, bear we pretty much come to a halt. Why? Because I'm dragging all the weight behind me. Hmm. When I stop paddling, which is often because I'm taking notes on my phone, I'm emailing, we keep going. And I realized from this, in the sense of motivation, it's harder to drag something along with us. What we need is a big push. Hmm. So this is, this is where I came up with this idea that we need to get it. Motivation is a dangling carrot. But what we need first is momentum. The momentum comes from the jumping off from getting away from what we hate. It's mm. kind of like if you imagine, we just watched the Olympics, right? So if you imagine those Olympic divers jump, jumping off the edge of the pool, that big push is powerful and likely determines whether they win. Yeah. Okay. So we have to, in order to really move forward, in order for motivation to even matter, we first have to determine what is it that we are so sick and tired of that we want to get away from that we're ready to do something about it, that we take that big push off the edge and get going. So good, Jeffrey. It makes so much sense. And I'm thinking about so many situations where pulling or dragging or whatever term you want to use, it feels so insurmountable. And yet yeah. momentum, someone just shoving you off the ledge or ripping off the Band-Aid or something that's more of an aggressive, you know, yep. someone just, you know, lighting you from behind. You're like, okay, that makes sense. So I would love for all of us to challenge ourselves and think about where are those situations where we should maybe stop trying to drag and, and find a little push and, and, you know, find a Rob. Maybe we need all find a Rob. Maybe that's the answer, you know. <laughs> we um, should all find a Rob. We Wouldn't should all find a, a Rob. 
So, so tell me about, this is one of the last things I want to talk about. Um, I could talk to you for hours and hours, but um, in the book, you talk about the importance of protecting our capacity to serve others. And you and I both are on the cusp of our our time to recharge. You're going to Hawaii. I'm starting staycation at 5 p.m. this evening for the next three weeks. We are staycationing all over Southern California. I'm going to try to stay off social media and email for at least one week straight. And we're just going to do all the things to protect my capacity, refill the cup, refill the soul so that I can show up big and recharged for the second half of the year in September. So that's how I do it very dramatically once a year, end of August, every year. That's my time. Um, but if we don't have the like the luxury or the space, or it took me years to figure out how to plan and structure for this, by the way, because to protect my time for two and a half, three weeks, for the last month, a million people are like, I can't talk to you till September. Are you kidding me? And it's it's so painful, but then you kind of get like, no, I, I need to mm -hmm. do this. I can't put $5 in the gas tank anymore to just get a couple miles down the road. I need a full service, you know? So so that's how I do it. Very dramatic, not for everybody. But um, tell us more about how we can, first of all, identify if it's time mm -hmm. to do a better job of this. And then once we identify that, how can we protect our capacity to serve mm -hmm. others? And why is it so important? So I think I would start with even identifying what kind of profession you're in. And I say yeah. that because... Um, if you're in a giving profession, right, uh, a coach, a consultant, a speaker, I mean, you know how exhausted, like, you know, you're in a giving profession when you feel different afterwards, whether it's exhausting or maybe you're, you're maybe you're charged up, but at some point it's draining, mm -hmm. right? Many of us are in, we're not, especially for your audience, your highlighters, like, it's not like they're, most of them are not punching clocks. Mm -hmm. Okay. No. So you're likely to be in a giving profession. And for me, you know, I lived so many years in Manhattan. I didn't think I'd ever leave Manhattan. That's where my base was as a photographer. Manhattan made me think bigger. It got me out of my head. As my mother said, it's why I came out because, I mean, when I told my mother I came out, when I told my mother I was gay, the first thing she said to me, is it because you moved to New York? <laughs> <laughs> said, kind of in a way, you know, yeah, and it's, in its yeah. own way, because I felt like I had permission to be myself. Yeah, I got yeah. out of the, you know, got out of the little country and um, it's in a big place. So it made me think big. The problem was that my career had shifted without my realizing it from being a full-time photographer to photographer and coach and speaker. And it was when I came to Miami and it is entirely why I live here. I came down here for three months, just doing the snowbird thing and realized, oh my gosh, I need a different way of living yeah. than New York city because yeah. thinking big is no longer the number one goal. The number one goal is recharging. Yeah. I need to be someplace where a, a, a walk on the beach is going to refuel me because guess what? I'm right back on a plane again. Yeah. Right. Life is draining. The life I live now is draining. It's I'm coaching people. I'm, I'm pouring everything I've got as I'm speaking. I'm traveling like many of us are. So first of all, identify your career and, and you have to proportionately how much you're giving. You have to refuel that reservoir. Think of it as a tank of water. Like you have to refill that. Otherwise you're going to run empty. Mm -hmm. So I actually am a huge proponent of, of just pay attention to your environment. You know, I've got, Aaron, I've got a candle burning right here, right? This is my uh, sh uh, breathe candle with peppermint and vanilla. Um, I light candles based on what I feel like I need. Like yeah. what's the scent I need. When, when, I, when I'm doing virtual gigs, I burn a relaxation candle because I'm naturally going to be overly hyper. So let's bring it down a little bit. Yeah. So I'm really big on environment and that includes where I live mm -hmm. and making sure you're refilling. So identify what you need. For me, unlike you, like in the other thing, I just want to offer another, many people can't do it as dramatically, but mm -hmm. every day of my life looks like this. I take my dog for a, a half hour, 40 minute walk in the morning on the, on the beach. The big thing for me, which is an everyday practice, I go somewhere around six, six thirty. I go for a four mile walk mm -hmm. and any direction I walk from, from where I live is going to be beautiful. I can decide whether I want the trees or I want the ocean or I want to be right down the middle of the city because I love the, the noise and the, the buildings. Um, so I decide every day, but I, I refer to it as my day bookend. That's I how I that. bookend my day. Mm -hmm. And it is something I look forward to. Like it's, you know, 3 p.m. right now as we're speaking Eastern time and three hours from now, I get to go for my four hour walk and I'm looking it. forward to it. 
So it doesn't have to be the big dramatic, but every day, what can you do? Yeah. Light a candle, change in the book. One of the things that's really caught on the book is what I introduced in the book called space switching. Yes. Switch your environment up. Like what can you do every moment of every day to keep yourself refueled? Yeah. And I love that there's so many options there because as I mentioned, like not all of us can live in Miami or by the beach. And it took me basically my entire career, only for the last three years have I figured out how to do this dramatic recharge, like two, three weeks, like full on European style, not working. And it took me years to figure out that that's what I actually really needed. And I I save up for it. The last six weeks I've been working overtime to try and create, like get everything done that I would get done in that time. So it takes a lot of planning. It's not for everybody, but I love that you also offer those small light a candle, even the what's going right journal, the, you know, take the bath, have the, you know, have the wine outside on your porch if you yep. can. Call the friend that always makes you feel so full. There's so many like little ways. Um, and I think the most important thing is just recognizing when it's been too long yeah. since you've protected yeah. I, that capacity. Rob, right? and I have a, Rob and I have a phrase, and I guess it's in part due to where we live, but it's also an acknowledgement that I think anybody can say to themselves, no matter where they live, is like, we should we should live our lives like we live on vacation. Yeah. Right. And that doesn't mean that we don't work. Like there are plenty of us do have a combination that blend of work, but that's the way my life feels like. My life feels like I'm working while on vacation because yeah. I've chosen to live like I'm on vacation. I'll jump in the pool in the middle of the day. I love right? it. So that to me is fun. You know, Rob and I talk about all the time. It's like, can we, we live like we're on vacation. I'm like, yeah. yeah, that's actually what the life should look like. Why we should be so divided, like work and yes. vacation. We, yes. we work like we're on vacation. I love that. Hartman always would say, we have to make sure we're always creating a life that we don't need a vacation from. Yep. 100%. And it's so good. And so um, so we're doing a pretty good job. I do need a vacation and I'm excited about it, but, but we're doing a pretty good job. Yeah. yeah. You do your best, right? Um, but yeah, that's so good. So, I mean, anyone that is listening, Jeffrey Shaw, you have you have workbooks, you have programs, you have... Tell us all the all the things, all, all the ways, things. and also tell us what you're reading because you're reading a great book you said too right now. Yeah. So, all right. So all the great things. So the thing I'm without a doubt most excited about, right? Yeah, obviously I'm really excited about the book, The Self-Employed Life, yes. but it's everything that's led to. And what that's led to is I'm now launching the Self-Employed Business Institute. First cohort begins September 8th. I'm so excited about this because I'm a, there. a book will be, right? A book, <laughs> people will read the book, but- in, a, in an you know in an educational format where I can coach them and teach them now I can change lives like I'm yeah. so excited yeah so we're in the middle of launching that and yeah so excited um they can check anything they want at jeffreyshaw.com that kind of leads to everything and although the institute is selfemployedbusinessinstitute.com it hasn't made its way to the website yet okay um we'll so links. what I'm reading I'm always reading something I, the book I just finished by John Jantz okay. uh, who wrote duct tape marketing Yep. Huge business classic. So his latest book, it's not out yet. I interviewed him, so I got an early read. It's out in September. It's called The Ultimate Marketing Engine. Really good. Okay. Okay. You know, what I like about it, and I said this to him in the interview, it's like, it is, it's like a real conversation about marketing. Like, this is marketing perspectives from somebody who's actually done the thing. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, it's not an academic version of marketing. It's not some guru. Like, there's some really, like, one of the things he talks about this so practical. He talks about scaling, scaling your business with your customers, because you know what? Most of us scale our businesses from the outside. We want more volume, more customers, more services. And what he's saying is you can scale your business within, like with the customers you already have so with a good, good referral system. So it's stuff like that. I really appreciate because yeah. I hate seeing people give bogus advice that actually harms people. I said earlier, like we should all take huge responsibility for our words yeah. And don't just toss things out that I said to somebody earlier, I asked somebody, I was speaking to a client earlier today who was challenged with this. I said, how do you interpret when somebody says to you, I made my first million? How do you interpret that? When somebody says, oh, I made my first million. How do you interpret that? Uh, I guess it depends on the way they say it and who it is. Because I think some people, if they say it like in a Newport Beach braggy douchey way, I'm like... That's so unattractive. But if I sit hear it from a, a gal that I know has been like working really hard and like did the work and and she's like, it's possible for you, then I feel motivated. So I think it depends on who it is. Yeah. Because what happens a lot of times, you know, people will say, oh, I made my first million. And what, what happens to people around them when they hear that 
is they might cower and think, oh my gosh, I'm nowhere near that. Yeah, get okay? small. Yeah. And then what you find out is what they meant is, yeah, they made their first million over five years. They didn't yeah. qualify that. Yeah. Because when you say this, I made my first million, there's different ways of interpreting that. There's different yes. ways of saying it. To, to one person, like I interpret it, meaning you made your first million in sales. Like this is the first year you hit a million in sales in that calendar year. Yes. Okay. But to somebody else, it means they, they hit the first million dollar mark over a series of years, but they didn't clarify it. Yeah. Okay. Without clarifying it, it has potential damage to disc, just to um, you know, downplay somebody else, yeah. to discredit them or make them feel worse about themselves. Yeah. So things like that should be clarified. I love okay? that. So I love this, you know, this ultimate marketing engine. One of the things I love about it and John's advice is that you just, you feel respected by the advice mm -hmm. because it's been lived. Yeah. So really eager for John to get that book out there. It's, it's excellent. Oh, fantastic. Well, I can't wait to read it and I cannot wait for your institute. Congratulations. Thank you. Everyone listening should go to jeffreyshaw.com. Check out all of his books, all of his resources. If you want more of this brilliance, it's all there. Follow him on the Instagram, follow him on all the places. And Jeffrey, I just cannot thank you enough. I mean, what a fabulous last thing to do before staycation begins. I hope you have all the fun in Hawaii. You deserve it. Thank and um, it's always just such a pleasure. So thank you so much. Likewise. Thanks for having me.